So welcome, Tigran, to the first episode of the Hayastan podcast. Uh, how's the coffee? Thank you, Nishan, for having me. Very excited to be here. The coffee is great. <laughs> We're drinking Armenian coffee made in Nishan's home, uh, the way grandmothers for thousands of years have been making it, I suppose. Uh, well, maybe not thousands of years, but quite a long time. Okay, my history is a little hazy on this. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... What's, what's your background and what's your connection to Armenia? What made you want to come to Armenia? Uh, great question. Um, I was born in Artsakh, but we moved early on because of the war. We first went to Russia, but Russia in the early 90s was very, very tough. So we made a very hard decision at the time to move to Armenia without knowing English. My parents had you know, three kids. And but they still did it to give us a better future. And I grew up there, went to college uh, for finance, for accounting, got my CPA, worked in banking, finance, and uh, the big four accounting firms. But then I wanted to transition into a different field of finance. Before that transition, before going to an MBA, I wanted to come and volunteer in Armenia for a year and there was no better program than Birthright Armenia. I've always wanted to experience living in Yerevan and Armenia for a little bit. Uh, but when I got to Yerevan, within three to six months, I knew that I wanted to stay here to help build the country, to provide something of value. And so I decided to, to live in Armenia and start a business here. So when you when you first wanted to start your business here, did anyone have a negative reaction? Did anyone call you crazy? A lot of people from back home did call me crazy for trying to start businesses here. And they would give me examples of why we shouldn't start a business here. But these examples were hearsay. You know, a friend of a friend tried something and it didn't work, or the government this, did this or did that, and they didn't have any concrete proofs. It was just a perspective that they had, and these, this perspective came from local Armenians that were born and raised here, but now moved to the U.S. and live there. So they haven't been back for maybe 10, 20 years, and so I believe that their perspective was a little tainted. So a few people were very negative on starting a business, especially when it came to starting a business in a digital currency space uh, with cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin because it's a very taboo topic in certain parts of the world. Hmm. And how about Yerevansis? What um, feedback did they have when they found out, when some people found out you wanted to start this business? Uh, some people were very uh, pro me starting this business. Uh, some people were against. For example, my uh, tailor said, when he heard that I wanted to start a business, said, God, no, why would you do that? Go back <laughs> to the US, <laughs> get married here, and then leave. Go get to the US. Here, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's one of the things that you'll hear, uh, if you, especially if you're a girl, um, and you get into a taxi, guys as well, they'll ask you, you know, where are you from? And all the, you know, basic interrogative questions. And then they'll ask if you're married. If you're not, then they know someone. Right. <laughs> that you can meet. <laughs> right. I've received those questions a lot as well. Like, are you married? How old are you? Oh, you have a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Marry someone here and then go back. Right. Go back to America. Yeah. Right. So Tigran, you mentioned something about the quality of life being better in Yerevan and that kind of made you fall in love with Yerevan and made you want to stay and found your business here. So elaborate a little more about that because a lot of what I'm hearing from locals, especially locals uh, who even people I worked with, uh, they have, you know, negative opinions of the quality of life in Armenia and a lot of just regular people you meet on the street mm -hmm. um, have a lot of issues with that. So elaborate a little bit on your observations. Yeah, so I've lived in Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. and I've also lived in Russia 
and now I've been in Armenia for about a year and a half. So I have the benefit of having multiple perspectives. And the reason I said the quality of life was high or I felt it was high was because the things that I valued Yerevan could provide, whereas in Cleveland I didn't have those things. And to give you an example is in the Midwest, you have to drive, you, your commute to work and back is about an hour to two hours a day. And that type of grind really um, affects you day in and day out. And on top of that, the weather was also very cloudy in Cleveland and the summers weren't that hot. And if you look at what Yerevan has to offer, it's sunny maybe 300 days out of the year. The winters aren't that cold in Yerevan. Uh, you see the sun every single day. The city is built in a way where you can walk anywhere in the downtown area and you don't really need a car. So I live in the city center and I can go outside of my door every single day and just walk everywhere that I need to. And that type of environment really appealed to me. So I, I lived in Chicago for a couple of years as a student yeah. at University of Chicago. And when I lived there, it was the polar vortex. So in Cleveland, I assume... We had that too, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, imagine December, you walk outside, you need to get to work, and your car is just covered in snow and ice, and you have to scrape it. Then you get on the road, and everyone's moving at, you know, 10 miles an hour. Um, your, I don't know, your heater breaks in your car, and you're freezing, and there's slush on the road. It's just not a very good experience. And I know, uh, I think we've gotten lucky in Yerevan because we've been here, we've both been here for about a year. Yeah. And the past winter was very mild. Right. I basically wore a sweater the whole winter. Right. So hopefully we get lucky again this year. I really hope so because I keep wanting to go to Tzachazor, which is the ski place, right. in, the ski resort in Armenia. Right. So you don't want it to be too bad. Right. I want some fresh powder. Right. Uh, so to elaborate on the food here, I grew up with parents who prepared food in the way that locals would prepare food, like dolma, type of spaghettis and pilaf and whatnot. And I'm not a huge fan of that, to be uh -huh. honest. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is, I think 80 years or 100 years of Russian influence has made the food very bland, doesn't have a lot of spice. There's a lot of salt and oils in those types of foods. And so I think the locals aren't exposed to the right type of foods, which in my opinion, they can be now with an influx of Syrian Armenians coming. So Armenia has seen a boom in Syrian owned businesses, mostly restaurants who have brought new spices and new cuisines, Mediterranean type cuisines with them. And that's the restaurants. Those are the restaurants that I try to frequent the most. Right. Um, I have noticed a lot of people, even locals, um, they like to uh, prefer uh, not only Syrian Armenian restaurants, but also Lebanese Armenian restaurants. Right. They're just restaurants owned by other uh, by people who are not from Yerevan because th there is a kind of stigma attached to that like they think they use I don't know Mariana brand mm. dairy products and things like that so I have I have heard about those types of issues yeah I, I found that also the service at uh, foreign owned or not foreign but uh, Syrian Armenians or Lebanese Armenian restaurants the service is much better and I'm not sure where that comes from but it's more similar to the service you'd expect in the U.S. where a waiter will ask how everything was, um, they'll be very attentive, uh, they'll take feedback seriously, and those types of things uh, I think are good for the restaurant business and makes me feel like a valued customer and that's why I frequent those places. Whereas places that are owned by locals are a little bit more nonchalant they, you know, they just serve you food and you get what you get. Hmm. So what, um, 
Uh, what are the places you like to frequent the most? What are some of your favorite restaurants in Yerevan? So basically, if I'm going out for lunch, Zatar Pizza is one of the best places to go. They have a really good Lama Ju and uh, falafel sandwich. If I'm going out for dinner, then I'll check out Anteb, which is, I think, near Pushkin, uh, or Zaytuna, which is on Gaskat. Those are two of my favorite Lebanese or Syrian or Armenian uh, Western cuisine I believe restaurants. Antep, Antep is, I believe, Syrian, Armenian owned. And Zaytuna, I'm not sure. I, I, was, I wasn't a huge fan of Zaytuna. It was kind of a smoke box for me. As a non smoker, it was tough for me to oh, sit I, in there. Oh, I didn't realize they. Oh, well, you know, Antep, they smoke in there as well. Yeah. That's when true. I come into a restaurant and people are smoking, I usually usually leave <laughs> <laughs> I I know the feeling I know the yeah. feeling but I think the culture is changing where more and more restaurants are now uh, going smoke free that's true I, I am seeing more restaurants like Tabule is one of my favorite restaurants in Yerevan a Lebanese uh, Armenian restaurant and nice. I believe they they do not allow smoking that's good maybe I should Maybe I should research that and take this out if they, if they actually do. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I believe that there are a lot of locals who would be of the opposite of opinion, that um, the Syrian Armenian restaurants are not very good mm -hmm. and, and that they don't know how to cook with the correct amount of spices or oil. So it's interesting that you, know, you have this kind of opposite perspective on this. Yeah. And I believe everything is an acquired taste. There's no good or bad. It's just subjective when it comes to food. And for example, if you grew up eating canned mushrooms, you're gonna prefer that over fresh mushrooms. For example, I grew up eating uh, discount or generic peanut butter, and I'll, I'll always get the generic peanut butter over the brand name peanut butter just because I like the way that it tastes to me because it's just more familiar. I think the way you change that is slowly integrate that those types of foods into the local culture, which I think is already happening. Right, with those uh, SAS exclusive peanut butter imports. Yeah, peanut butter and jelly needs to make a comeback in Armenia. A comeback or just an introduction? It, both, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't don't like buying cereal as well and Cereal is also so expensive. Like che a box of Cheerios is a SAS exclusive. Yeah. And it's, um, th I believe, 3,500 dirham. Wow. About seven, seven dollars. Yeah. Uh, that's another thing it, it, with uh, Armenia. If you can find it locally, it's usually dirt cheap. And that's what I meant by cost of living. Uh, you know, uh, grains and um potatoes and fruits those things that are produced in Armenia are very inexpensive but when it comes to those things like peanut butter or Kellogg's cereal Cheerios because they have to be imported uh, and cost of shipping isn't free uh, those will be very expensive hmm. all right so let's move on to um, your business let's talk a little bit about coin box so what is coin box and um, what are your goals with this uh, cryptocurrency business? Sure. So one of my first projects when I was in Armenia was to bring PayPal uh, here. Now, with PayPal, Armenians can send money, but they can't receive money, mm -hmm. which is uh, brings about a lot of problems if you're either an app developer and you want to make a game or some type of app where you want to charge money for it, it's very difficult if you don't have PayPal. And the other um, aspect of that is if you're in e-commerce or you're in retail, say you make um, dolls and you want to export it in the US, well, your customers can't use their credit cards or they can't use PayPal to buy it from your website. So for example, there's a business called HDIF and they go to uh, they go to border villages where the men have left to Russia for work 
and ha and the people in those border villages are the elderly, the women, and the children, and they get the women that are left to craft, use their skills to craft some toy or some goods, and then they take those goods and they market it and sell it in the U.S., which is a very admirable thing. But the biggest challenge that they're having is that if you are an individual from the U.S. and you want to buy a gift, you have to send a money order or a check from the U.S. to Armenia, which might take several weeks. And once they receive the cash or the check and they cash it, then they'll send you the product. And that whole transaction may take up to a month. And if you're used to Amazon Prime, you're not going to use, you're not going to buy something from HDIF because it's just not very convenient to you. And so that really hurts a lot of the business in Armenia and hurts exports for small and medium sized enterprises. So I thought of, uh, or my project with bringing PayPal to Armenia came to a head when we reached out to the head of PayPal Europe and Russia division, but they weren't interested, or at least they worked with us, but after two, three months, we realized that they weren't interested. And I think Armenia doesn't have a business case for a business to come here. A lot of people, a lot of people in Armenia that live here are under the different impression. They think that our government isn't putting in the effort to reach out to PayPal to make them come here, but it's the other way around. Our government has tried three to four times, but it's up to PayPal to make that decision and they just won't now or in the near future so in the meantime as i was researching paypal i was also doing research on cryptocurrencies in two, early 2017 and once i understood the potential of this new technology uh, it changed everything i knew how important it was to have a currency like Bit Bitcoin that's not controlled by any central government, that's totally digital, that can be sent for pennies on the dollar. Um, that was, and, and nobody can stop you. That was an incredible idea, an incredible technology, and I wanted to spread it all over Armenia. And that's where the idea of Coinbox came to be because when I looked around, nobody was doing that. And for for there to be adoption or market participants, you first need to be able to acquire and to sell your cryptocurrencies on an open market, on a platform. And that didn't exist in Armenia. Right, because there was no way for people to buy and sell cryptocurrency with Dram. Right. right. And even if you were able to find a broker, which there exists in Armenia, that could uh, find you a buyer or a seller, it would take multiple days. And if it didn't take multiple days, if he instantly bought it from you, then it would cost a lot more. So you might be paying 10% or 15% to sell or buy cryptocurrencies, which if you look at the international market or in markets where it's free or it's legal to buy and sell, they usually charge you less than 1%. It's usually 0.25% to buy a cryptocurrency. But in Armenia, it's 10% if you want to buy mm. because of all the frictions that exist. And if you have 10% or 15% transaction costs, nobody's gonna wanna own it or buy it or sell it. So that is crippling to any developing uh, market and I wanted to help change that. Hmm. Um, so let's date the recording a little bit here. Right now one of the most important issues facing uh, Armenians is the issue of Iranian Armenians accounts getting frozen due to the recent sanctions by uh, John Bolton and the American government. So what what's your take on that? Like how can Coinbox be an important factor in that issue right so i think when the sanctions got reapplied a lot of people didn't really understand especially the people working in the banking sector in armenia didn't really understand how to apply those sanctions so there was a lot of miscommunication so at first the banks said even if you're it doesn't matter if you're an iranian citizen or an armenian 
that was born in Iran, if it says Iran on your passport, then we're freezing your account. I think they've since rolled back on that and are a little bit more lenient, but but what that shows is how much power the banking sector has, not just in Armenia, but all over the world, where you can wake up one day and all of a sudden, all of your life savings that you had in a bank are now frozen and you have no way of paying for rent or paying your bills or your kid's tuition. And I think uh, Bitcoin is the antithesis of that, where no one can take it away from you. And you can also send it between uh, borders because Bitcoin doesn't have borders. And so you can send it from one account to another account for, you know, one cent or 10 cents, usually between those uh, amounts. And you can send it almost instantly. You don't have to wait 35 business days. So if you are an Iranian citizen living in Armenia, but most of your income is comes from Iran and your money's in an Iranian bank, what you can do is you can buy Bitcoin and then send it to Armenia, sell it here, sell those Bitcoins here on the open market and have cash in your, in your hand to pay your bills. So I think Bitcoin can facilitate those transactions where now the banking systems don't. And um, part of how they implemented the sanctions was crazy because a lot of these Iranian Armenians were born in Iran, but maybe ever since they were little, they were in Armenia, they have businesses in Armenia, they have families in Armenia. Like they're not Iranians, like they're not, um, I don't even know, I don't culturally, even know how to put it correctly. Yeah, yeah, culturally they feel more Armenian than Iranian. Right. They just have the uh, bad luck of being born in Iran at a wrong time. In history, right. at a politically um, unstable time in those relationships, yeah, it just goes to show how unfair the current global financial system is, where uh, America gets to weaponize the the financial sector and call the shots. So if it doesn't like what you're saying, it doesn't like what you're doing, it can shut down, shut you down. Even if you didn't do anything, exactly, and they didn't do anything, right? The Armenians, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's an it's an opt in system instead of an opt out system where they just wave their hand and you know everyone gets shut down. Whether you agree with Julian Assange or not, you have to admit that it's kind of scary when the federal government uh, looks at an organization like WikiLeaks and says, "Hey, we don't like the stuff that you're reporting on or the stuff that you're leaking, you're making us look bad. So we're going to shut off Visa, MasterCard, PayPal payments to you. So with one stroke, they were able to cut off WikiLeaks organization from uh, being able to receive donations. Luckily, there was Bitcoin. A lot of people donated Bitcoin back in 2015. And with the recent boom, uh, WikiLeaks now has a lot of funding that they can still operate. But that aside, that type of power is scary for any type of uh, organization. Imagine if you were living in a country in the near future and a dictator or tyrant saw that you went to the wrong uh, rally or saw that you went to um, an opposition party. He can uh, ban your account then you have no way of uh, making a living right uh, so a lot of local Armenians um, even I just answered the door yeah and um, you know they they were asking for donations but at, at the end of that uh, she said where are you from she interrogated you yeah she interrogated me she said where are you from and I said I'm from America and uh, she said then what are you doing here? Uh -huh. So that, I've been asked that question a lot. Right. Have you been asked that question? Uh, I've been asked that question as well. And I think if you're a local here and most of your network is also your friends and family who are locals, then your experiences seeing them try to leave the country, 
for better opportunities. So when they see the opposite happen, you know, a counter narrative or people coming to Armenia, they get confused and they want to know why. I think this goes back to the economy, uh, which is the most important thing for Armenia is to develop it. But you have right now with so much turbulence in the world and so much technology, you have two types of workers. You have high skilled workers that are in demand and you can't get enough of them. Even in Armenia, programmers, even um, auditors and financial specialists and engineers probably and doctors, all those specialists are in high demand in Armenia and all everywhere around the world. But because of automation and technology, if you have maybe a high school education or not a lot of skills, then it's really hard to find a good paying job in Armenia or the rest of the world as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the attitudes that, you know, this is part of the reason why I wanted to start this podcast is because um, Armenians in the diaspora, especially the traditional diaspora as in the post-genocide diaspora, um, they are not aware of a lot of these issues and the socioeconomic realities in Armenia and of uh -huh. the negative attitudes a lot of people have about opportunities in Armenia. So it's really important to get um, your perspective on this issue. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting about how things work in Armenia because Yerevan is five to ten years behind technologically on everything you can if you have a lot of skill willpower determination you can basically take a business model that works in the US come to Armenia and try it out here of course it won't be the same exact thing it'll look a little different but it will be useful and it will work one of the examples is look at the local um, Uber type company called GG. So GG is almost um, almost exactly like Uber in the sense of a ride sharing app. And it works great in Armenia. But it was only started, I think, a few years ago, whereas Uber has been operating since maybe 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of examples like that in Armenia where you take something that works in the U.S. or Russia or China that's already had some uh, years in the market, you bring it to Armenia and you have it develop here. And GG is, of course, a very successful company and they just um, expanded to Georgia, if nice. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think I heard that as well. Yeah, so, yeah, there are definitely several examples of the other example is for uh, menu.am it's I think kind of like Grubhub where you go online you pick uh, you, you pick food from basically any restaurant in, in Yerevan and then it gets delivered to you within an hour mm -hmm. so we will start the High Astan podcast app picks uh, menu.am for your food delivery needs and uh GG for your taxi services. Although I will say one thing is uh, I find this to be very interesting is that when you clone something, every time you clone something from the US market or the Russian market to the Armenian market, you get some forms of mutation. And uh, to give you an example, if you order a GG or a Yandex, Yandex is also a ride sharing app. Um, what you'll find is some key differences or a few differences. For example, if I order an Uber and I place a pin near an area, that's where the taxi is going to go. Uh, and that's where I'm going to go and meet this Uber driver. But if you do the same thing in Armenia, as soon as you hit order, you'll get a call from the taxi driver asking you where you are. <laughs> and that is a little frustrating, but hopefully um, hopefully that'll change. And uh, that's helped improve your Armenian, right? Uh, 
actually helped improve my Russian, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so how how is your Armenian doing? Uh, my Armenian's doing pretty well. I'm taking lessons twice a day, and I'm trying to speak as much as I can. But the biggest challenge I'm having is um, because I'm mostly living in Yerevan. You have uh, young people in Yerevan who all speak or mostly speak English and you have the older generation that mostly speaks Russian and because I've lived in Russia and I know Russian I can get by very very easily by only speaking English or Russian and so that makes it hard for me to force myself to speak Armenian because I always default to the to the language that I know right to speed things up right and that's a good segue into um the Arme- talking a little bit about the Armenian community in Cleveland because I don't I don't personally know much about that so mm-hmm. what uh, what was your experience like in the Armenian community in Cleveland it's a fantastic community there's only 3,000 Armenians in Ohio uh, but the Armenians that do live in Cleveland it's a very tight-knit community they do a lot of things together so we have a young professionals group that hangs out a lot. We have uh, a church group, a women's guild group. We volunteer together in different uh, areas in the city. And once a year, we host the Armenian Bazaar, which is a food festival of sorts, right. where we invite everyone from Cleveland. We usually get about 5,000 to 10,000 visitors over the weekend. And we cook things like kebabs, and we make tabouli and different, um, different baked uh, baked goods like baklava. And then we have a dance group come from, I think, Detroit or Chicago, and they put on the show. It's a really great festival that we do every year, and you couldn't ask for a better community than the Armenian community in Cleveland. So is there a church or a school there, in Cleveland? There is a church and there's a cultural center and uh, and most people go to the church and cultural center. In fact, New Year's is held in that cultural center right by the church every year, that big hall that we have. Uh, so that's also a lot of fun. Nice. Nice. Um, Unfortunately, I think because uh, when I mentioned about quality of life everyone that lives so spread out in the midwest including cleveland and there's a few there's pockets of armenian families all over the suburbs of cleveland so it's really hard to meet if you you're every single person is 45 minutes away from every other single person uh so if you want to meet it's very inconvenient so that it's hard to organize things like having a school, for example, or having a sports team because everyone just lives so far away. So that's one thing that I would really wish would have existed in Cleveland is an Armenian school. Right, right. Um, So uh, you came to Armenia initially as a volunteer with Birthright Armenia. What can you say about uh, your experience volunteering at the Central Bank? Um, so yeah, uh, the uh, the birthright experience was incredible, and that's one of the reasons why it's so good was because I got an opportunity that I wouldn't have been able to get without them, which was to intern at the central bank where I did really important projects, including the PayPal project. I looked at creating the first credit union in Armenia. I interned for the Foundation for Servicemen, which is uh, an insurance program for soldiers fighting on the front lines. They've also researched cryptocurrencies, which was uh, a very cutting edge technology at the time that a lot of people at the bank were very curious and interested about. So without Birthright, I don't think I would have been able to have such a unique experience. One thing that um, I've learned uh-huh. is that a lot of Armenians are very suspicious mm-hmm. of banking in general and opening bank accounts and the financial system so what can you say about that right um when i was uh working at the central bank of armenia i had the unique experience of uh 
working for a very wonderful and experienced man by the name of Varujan Avedikian. He was a lawyer by trade, and he was also uh, a diasporan, I think, considered diasporan, because I think he was born in Greece. But he's been here since the 90s, and he's, um, you know, given his life to service for Armenia. And he would tell me very interesting uh, anecdotes about what the banking system was like in the 90s. Uh, because it was a mess before the central bank, which kind of came to Armenia in the late 90s and cleaned everything up. Before it was like the wild, wild west where you didn't have a regulator and anyone can open up offices, uh, be banking offices, but because no one really had experience in banking, they we open one day and close the next day. But the other part that was very interesting to know was how uh, how much corruption there was within the government, not in the banking system, but in the government, where a story he told me was how a police officer, a police officer could walk into any bank branch and request a bribe. So that changed uh, in the late 90s when the head of the central bank called the president and said, hey, listen, we have this constitutional law that says that the central bank is the regulator and has the authority over banks, why is a law enforcement officer doing these things? And so uh, one call from the president to the uh, police chief ended that. But I thought it was funny how that was allowed to happen uh, as, you know, as late as the early 90s. But uh, one of the reasons why Armenians are suspicious of the banking system is because they lost so much in that transition from uh, from the Soviet Union to the Republic and there hasn't been a lot of financial education to begin with and I think that's one of the reasons why people like cash because it can't be frozen and that's why they like the dollar because it's a universal currency that's accepted by everyone right right I know a lot of people they um, convert their dirhams into dollars when they want to keep uh, it's a store of value, away yeah. Because they view the dollar as a more stable form of currency than the dirham. And so they keep that as their uh, rainy day fund. Yeah. Um, when, the, when the dirham was invented and put into circulation, if you look at the chart history from, I think, 93, uh, it, was, it went on the market at a rate of one dollar to nine drums now and that that rate didn't stay that way because it shot up to 200 within that same day and then and then again to four or five hundred within a month and that's where it stayed for most of the 90s going up and down up and down around 400 to 600 um, and so when you have a currency move like that it creates instability and that's why people just feel more comfortable having the dollar because they see the United States as this shining city on the hill that's also very stable. Right. Uh, what, what were some of the initial difficulties you faced when you moved to Armenia? I think the initial difficulties, now that I think back about it, was my expectations. The biggest ones being service at restaurants. So, you know, when you sit down at a restaurant in the U.S., you know, they bring you a, a glass of water, they bring you a menu, um, then they're back within two to five minutes and they constantly check up on you to, you know, to clear the table, to ask if you want anything else, um, to ask how everything was. And I've got used to that type of service. But when, when I was in Armenia, they don't do that. You have to call the waiter when you're ready to order. Then you have to also call them uh, for every single uh, interaction. You know, if you want to check, you call them. If you want something else, you call them. And that was, I think, a little difficult initially because it was... Uh, it was awkward. It was awkward. It was very awkward, yeah. You, you were sitting there and you weren't sure what to do. Yeah, and I noticed that happened with, you know, my friends and family who visit me in Armenia. They sit down at a restaurant and they're like, why haven't we been served yet? Why hasn't anyone approached us? And I tell them, hey, you got to call them. They don't come to you. Mm-hmm. So Tigran, what advice do you have for diaspora and Armenians 
uh, who are thinking of coming to Armenia maybe as a volunteer or through some other program? Uh, I would definitely recommend doing Birthright Armenia. It's helped me a lot, especially someone who doesn't have family here and who doesn't know the language that well. It's a really great network, either Birthright or Armenia or some other type of organization that helps you come to Armenia, helps you settle, helps you integrate into the city here. Uh, I've known some people that haven't done that and what I found is that they're very lonely or they don't have a lot of friends initially or they feel out of place and if you come and do Birthright Armenia not only do you get uh, to interact with people your age and your you know from your culture but also different cultures around the world you get a lot of Russian Armenians South American Armenians um, but you also get to go on really great excursions all over Armenia, an opportunity that you wouldn't really have coming by yourself, and you get professional networking experience by working at different uh, job sites. So all of that for a couple of months real, really helps you integrate into Armenia at a very low cost to you because again they can provide you with a homestay so you get to interact with people that actually live in Armenia. And I think it's an incredible, indispensable tool, uh, Birthright Armenia. So I would definitely recommend anyone interested in coming to Armenia to look at that program. All right, so I think that about does it for today. So thank you very much for coming on the show, Tigran. And thank you so much, Nishan, for having me. If you want to check out um, or learn more about what cryptocurrency is, check out my website at coinbox.am. We have a great frequently asked questions sections. Uh, and also, thanks for the coffee. It was, uh, it was the best coffee I've ever had. Real Armenian coffee. Exactly. <laughs> made with a German jazve? Made with a German jazve. So nice. no, nothing made in Turkey here. Yeah, that's right. See you next time.